All right, uh, we've got our thermodynamics homework assignment I just handed back, and I thought I'd solve a few of these problems to help some of you that are maybe struggling with some of this and, and help you perhaps find ways that you can uh, avoid losing points and increase your understanding and feel a little bit more confident and prepared going into that first exam that's coming up at the end of the week. So let's go ahead and dive right in. If you have questions, uh, come see me in class or come you know, visit my office or go see the QSC and we'll get you squared away. But um, start now because that exam is coming. So here we go. So the first problem we have here, we've got what? We've got a, a gas system uh, or you know maybe a reaction or something going on inside of a, a balloon. And I always like to sketch these guys just because it helps me understand things and what's actually going on here. And we've got our you know, reaction here and, and I, I typically like to go ahead and label this uh, if the problem asks for it great which it does in this case but you don't have to always uh, um, have the problem ask you for it but we've got a closed balloon here right and that means that uh, gas can't come in and out uh, energy transfers can happen so that we know is a closed system right so that's really important to identify that um, and we also see here that we've got exothermic reaction that shows you that uh, there is a change in energy in the form of heat so the Q of the system has a negative sign that's really important and then we notice that the volume of the balloon uh, increases which is really important and so here we see then that the work of the system if the work is uh, being done by the system that's also a negative sign and that's a good old PV expansion work that we talked about so many days in class so there you go right that's really important so you've got energy being lost here in the form of both heat uh, and work so both of those are negatives really important all right let's continue on uh, the next one we've got uh, a one mole sample of helium gas and a one mole sample of ammonia gas that means we've got the same number of particles in these two uh, samples and they're held at the same temperature so that's important and then it says uh, they both behave as ideal, so that's good. Um, that means we're not going to have any intermolecular forces or you know, any major deviations in behavior. But it says, do they have the same total internal energy? And that's really important. So let's go ahead and look at what the um, components of the internal energy for both samples will look like. Well, if we look at helium, right? Helium's just simply a monoatomic, right? It's a monoatomic ideal gas, which means that its only contribution to internal energy is kinetic, and it's very simply uh, translational kinetic energy, right? So that's really important. There's no rotational, no vibrational, there are no potential energy contributions. That's it. And so there you go. And, and that's a very important uh, fundamental uh, paradigm to realize when we're solving problems, especially when we deal with PV work. That'll help you a lot, especially when you get isothermal uh, processes that you know that if the temperature doesn't change, remember kinetic, uh, average kinetic translational energy is what we define temperature as, and precision of language is really important in thermodynamics. And so that's, that's it for that guy. Uh, for ammonia, however, it's not quite so simple. And if you go back to 111, right, and you remember what this looks like, you might say, okay, well, that's a, a trigonal pyramidal structure, I've got some bonding going on, so you do have some potential energy uh, contributions due to the bonding. Uh, we said they both behave as ideal, so we'll say that, you know, uh, they're no intermolecular forces, but since this is a molecular structure, just like helium, it will have uh, a kinetic component due to translational. However, it will also have uh, rotational and vibrational contributions and that's really important so if you sum all these up at the same temperature it's really important to realize they do have the same average translational kinetic energy because they're at the same temperature however um, unlike helium ammonia will have um, additions due to the rotational vibrational which are really important so that means that uh, the internal energy of the system for ammonia is larger than helium at the same temperature and that's really important I think a few of you uh, were not careful or precise in your description and so make sure to go and clear that up all right next one this is a, a fun little chemistry 111 review deals with calorimetry 
Um, you know, we've talked a lot about this in class. We, we've measured things with the coffee cup in lab, and so let's go ahead and jump right in. Well, if you think about this, the way I look at it is I say, okay, well, I've got a, a bomb calorimeter, and that's really important, right? And I even tell you here, kind of redundant, but that's the case. You're dealing with constant volume. And so that's really important to say that uh, delta V here is zero. And this is a habit I hope you really get into is translating um, the verbiage into symbology and, and kind of giving yourself hints when it's really important because to me thermodynamics is all about language, it's all about translation and the math is easy, it's, it's just you know <laughs> arithmetic, it's not even hard and you just gotta think about what's going on, how do these numbers relate to the actual phenomenon that you're observing and so here you've got something, uh, you've got a delta V equals zero and that's a nice rigid container not only that, it's an adiabatic system, so we can say that for the calorimeter, we can say that the Q of the system is zero, and that's going to be um, equal to the Q of the reaction plus the Q of the um, calorimeter, right? And so let's go ahead and, if you think about that, you can relate that to the fact that we're given the heat capacity, right? So C cal times delta T. And if you don't remember that, it's really easy. Just make sure to use your units. You've got kilojoules over degree C. If you multiply it by a change in temperature, you knock out that degree C and you're left with energy, which is what Q is all about, right? And so we can then say that's equal to Q of the reaction plus, uh, what do we have here? We got 5.01 kilojoules per degree C. I'll throw that in there. And then delta T is simply equal to Right, the final temperature minus the initial temperature. Right, and that's really important. Now here this is going to give us another hint, right? The temperature went up, so that means heat was transferred from the reaction to uh, the water probably in the calorimeter, right? And so that's that's telling us already that there's that was an exothermic reaction. So let's let's go over here and make sure we we catalog that. That means our sign would probably be negative, right? And let's see what we get here. That's going to be equal to the Q of the reaction plus, what did I get? I got something like, oh, I think it was 8.77 kilojoules, which means then that um, Q of the reaction mathematically is negative 77, or 8.77 kilojoules. Yeah, not bad. Okay, so that negative sign is really important. It matches reality. Now, however, we need to think about what the question's asking. They want kilojoules per mole. Now is when you bring in the mass. You don't start plugging in the mass of methane. You don't start doing that right at the beginning. You gotta get your heat first. Now let's go in and say, okay, well now my Q of reaction is gonna be equal to negative 8.77, right? Just because we're dividing by um, the moles here doesn't change the fact that it's exothermic. And that sign's so important. So here we have 0 0.196 grams. Grams of what? Well, that's methane, right? And then we're going to multiply that by what well, we got? One mole of CH4 over, uh, I even was so nice to give you the molar mass here. Oops, there we go. Just the grams there because we already did that. And I think I get something on the order of negative uh, 718 kilojoules per mole, right? That's really important. So really you think about it, it's two steps, right? You find the, the heat either released or absorbed. In this case, the reaction released some heat into the calorimeter, and then you divide it by the amount of materials you have, a material you had there, and boom. So negative 718 kilojoules per mole. Ah, nice little question here, nice conceptual question, really important. Well, remember this is a a bomb calorimeter, right? And we said that delta V equals zero. So if you think about delta U of the system, right? We know from the first law here that it's equal to Q of the system plus Q, or sorry, excuse me, getting a little tired tonight, uh, work of the system, right? We can only have energy changes in terms of heat and work. Well, and you remember that work, right, can be expressed as negative P external delta V. Well, if delta V is zero, that kills that work term. So that's kind of neat. That means then that the Q you measure at constant volume is equal to delta U. And that's a little bit different, right, than what we measured in lab. We measured the Q at constant pressure. And when you do that, that's delta H. And that's really important to think about. So there you go.
All right, moving along. We're we're making some progress here on a, a Sunday night. Um, well, <laughs> when I'm right reading this and, and, and translating it, so let's see what we got here. Here's a nice chemistry 111, right? We've got a oh typo there. I should have been really careful to say okay. Well, in this case, we're looking for delta H standard because I've given you heats of formation at standard states. Really important reaction of okay. We've got some ammonia gas, right? So we do that, all right, that's really important. We've got gas plus um, molecular oxygen, right? That's one of our nice diatomics. And we can say uh, that's gonna go to, what do we got here? We've got some nitrogen dioxide. And finally, some liquid water, right? And it's important that we think about the states, right? Because the heats of formation are related to the states. And so we need to balance this, and hopefully you balanced it before you started to do all the math. And so let's go ahead and fill in these nice stoichiometric coefficients, right, using the nice skills that you learned from 111, hopefully. And there we go, right? So now we just are going to solve for the standard heat of reaction using the ta table of data. Remember, that's the summation of our, our products, uh, the heats of their formation, uh, multiplied by their stoichiometric coefficients minus the reactants and so let's just dive right in we've got four moles NO2 and if you look that one up on the table right that's only 34 uh, kilojoules make sure to watch your signs right that's really important and then we're going to add that to what do we got we've got six moles of water there right that's important uh, and that's a, a big old value there, 286 kilojoules per mole. So there's all of our, our products. Now we're going to subtract from that um, our reactants. And so we have four moles of ammonia gas, right? And you look on the table and everything's given to you. So nice there. You don't even have to go back to your OpenStack book or your uh, text that you might have purchased. And now you say, oh, wait a minute, plus Oh no, Dr. Porter didn't even give us the uh, oxygen value. What a jerk. Well, you know, if you think about it, enthalpy, right? We remember talking about enthalpy being a relative scale, right? And what, what was our relative zero? We, well, we assigned the elements of their standard states as our zeros. And so you don't have to worry about oxygen. So maybe I'm not quite a big of a, a jerk as some of you think I am. But again, uh, you know, I'll leave that up to you. So we do the math here. Um, and I get something like negative, meaning this is exothermic, 1396 kilojoules. So there you go. Uh, you can say per mole of reaction if you wish as written, but that's good enough. There we go. All right. Not bad. We're moving along. Next page. Okay. Here's a very uh, simple uh, PV work problem that we've been doing, you know, pretty much since the first week or so. And some things that you want to do here is you want to, you want to get used to using your PV uh, indicator diagrams, and so I, I would urge you to just go ahead and label these. You've got um, you know your P external, right? What you're pushing against, or what's pushing against you, and uh, we've got ATM given here, and our volume in liters, right? That's really important. So here we've got uh, uh, some helium monoatomic ideal gas that's excellent that means then that uh, the average uh, kinetic energy is related to temperature and it's our only contribution to internal energy so that's really important to note uh, here we've got an uh, initial volume of good old 10.0 liters and we're going to some um, V final that we don't know quite yet but we start out um, thinking about this guy being under some pressure here. It was under, what do we got? 2.44 atm, and it's going to expand isothermally, so delta T equals zero, against the co constant atmospheric pressure. So constant atmospheric pressure, right? That's irreversible expansion against uh, constant atmospheric, atmospheric pressure at 1 atm. So here we go. We're going to make sure that we're expanding against this 1 atm. And we're going to go from our initial to our final state. So we go in this direction. And if you think about it, right, you know that, you know, you can sit there and think about P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. And 
If you do that little analysis, you'll know that we end up going to a final volume of 24.4 liters. And the neat thing about these PV diagrams is that they can really help you understand. You know, we, we saw the integrals in class. The math is trivial, um, but really thinking about the area under the curve as the work, right? The work system, and that's really important. And we can calculate that now. We can say, okay, the work of the system is equal to negative P external, right, times delta V. Crank that one out. Well, it's negative, you know, times 1.0 atm and the delta v in this case right was 14.4 uh, uh, liters and you know if we do this we're gonna get liter atmospheres i don't know about you but that's that's one of the crappiest units of, of energy I, I just don't like dealing with those and so i love you know call me old-fashioned i i love the jewel uh, and so we sit there and we'll say okay well that will allow us to convert from liter atmospheres to joules and remember we've got a negative sign built in here but even if you forgot it's no big deal we know that the system is expanding it's doing work on the surroundings and so its ability to do work in the future has been diminished so that's negative value there um, and we get I think I get something like 1.46 uh, and I, I actually go went ahead and converted to kilojoules and you know we pay attention to our sig figs there and then boom now Next thing you want to know is is what's U and W. I always I, we just solve for W rather. So there you go. Uh, Q and W. Well, if you remember right, we dealt with isothermal. So isothermal conditions for a monoatomic ideal gas, right? If that's the case, then there's only a average kinetic energy of translation uh, contribution. So if the temperature doesn't change, the average translational kinetic energy doesn't change which means then that the delta u for the system does not change which is awesome which means that's equal to q system plus work system which tells you then that work and heat are related uh, they're the same magnitude but opposite signs so now we can say that the work for this step is positive 1.46 kilojoules which is pretty cool so there you go you've got your internal energy zero you've got your work system negative uh, our signs are really important I always like to emphasize that and there you go all right now we're gonna repeat uh, or actually push this guy back to its starting condition by uh, compressing it and so he will set up a new uh, PV diagram, indicator diagram, thanks to good old uh, Watt for doing that, right? And so we've got our 24.4, that's our volume in liters. Okay, so in this case though, we want to go back, and our original pressure was 2.44. That's that's actually way up here if we keep our, our uh, scale kind of consistent, right? So this is going to be 2.44 atm. And this is, again, irreversible against constant pressure. So we're going to be pushing this one back and pressing this piston back, right? And so we can look at our integral here, and we can say, wow, look at that. That's work of the system here. And this is the one where a lot of you guys get upset, and you're like, man, it takes so much more work to reset this piston than the work we got out of it. And you're absolutely light right. And so, again, it's irreversible, right? So we're uh, work of the system here is equal to negative P external delta V which is equal to in this case be careful right it's negative 2.44 uh, atm times your delta V in this case it's going to go back right so you're reducing the volume so you've got a negative sign here and again I'm not a big fan of liter atmospheres so I'm gonna go ahead and use my conversion factor And there you go. You crank this one out, and I think I got something like positive, right? Because you've got a negative times a negative. Plus, remember, you're, the surroundings are doing work on the system, so the system's ability to do work in the future is, is increased. So I get something like 3.56 kilojoules. Wow. Look at how much more work it took to reset that than the work we got on the expansion stroke there. Again, it's, it's isothermal, right? So delta T equals zero which means for a monoatomic ideal gas, the internal energy of the system has not changed one bit. And we can use the first law 
to relate the two, right? Just like we did before. So then the Q of the system is equal in magnitude, but opposite in sign to the work. In this case, that was done on the system. So here we have uh, a positive work. That means this is gonna be um, exothermic, which is really neat. So there you go. Um, and that's really pretty trivial arithmetic. But, and I always challenge you guys at the end uh, to talk about the signs here. And so without doing any real math here, we can say for step one, right, uh, the work done was negative because, let's see if I can grab it there, all right, because it was uh, PV work uh, done by the system, right? So it was expansion, and that's always negative work system. I don't know what's going on with my pen when I try to write into a, a table. That kind of stuff is goofy, right? Uh, there we go. Uh, Q of the system. So remember, this is really important. This is a uh, monoatomic ideal gas at isothermal conditions. So remember, we have delta U uh, for the system, and that was equal to zero. And then for step two, we had positive work, right, for that system, which means then that it was it was uh, exothermic, which we talked about. So again, that's a, a negative sign there. It's negative. Um, work of the system for the whole cycle. This is the one we talked about before. Uh, work uh, of the system for step two was bigger than work of the system for step one. And obviously, it was um, positive for um, the second step, it took much more energy to push it back, compress it back down, and so that one dominates it, and there you go. For step one, again, this is pretty easy for internal energy. We said, okay, well, uh, delta U for the system, and this is really important. This has, you know, you've got a monoatomic ideal gas, right? You got helium, so it's important to um, tell me it's monoatomic. And ideal, right? Because this is not always going to be the case. So you got to tell me. That's really important. And then finally, uh, the last one's probably my favorite question, right? Because of the fact that it's for the cycle, for the whole thing. And remember, the beauty of a state function is that it doesn't care how you got somewhere. All it cares about um, is where you started and where you ended. And for a cycle, right? For a cycle, you start somewhere, and by definition, you come back to it. So you can very simply say, State functions are our friends. We love state functions. They make our life so much better. Um, anytime you can get a state function, you should be happy, right? There we go. That was supposed to be a smiley face. There we go. We love state functions. Okay. So I'm running a little bit long. I'm going to shut it down. Shut it down here, and hopefully, you know, this was helpful. Uh, if you have some feedback, let me know. I'll work on my handwriting. I know it's garbage, and uh, hopefully, this will help some of you. Uh, get ready. The exam's coming. Um, you know, come with your questions. We're going to be doing some problem solving in class, doing some problem solving in lab this week, and get you ready. You should do well on this. There's no reason you can't. Um, we want to help you do well. So um, work, work, work. Problems. That's the best advice I can give you.